What's up everybody, welcome to Found Flicks. On this ending explained, we'll be looking at Glass, the culmination of M. Night Shyamalan's trilogy that began with Unbreakable and the later surprisingly connected Split. Even though everyone was surprised that Split did connect to Unbreakable, this was instantly an exciting prospect for the two films to cross over into one bigger universe. And I was extremely hyped for Glass. But then reviews started coming out and for the most part it appeared that M. Night had blown the goodwill he had been rebuilding since his low budget indie comeback The Visit. To me, it wasn't quite the disaster that reviews were painting, but it didn't meet my admittedly high anticipation. And therein lies the problem with expectations, because that inevitably leads to disappointment. Especially with a filmmaker like M. Night, who thrives on doing the unexpected. So in a way, as Glass got deeper into its runtime, and I found myself questioning several of the story directions, I realized that I needed to think of things in a different way. Yes, the movie makes some very divisive choices, particularly in the extremely messy third act, but these were all obviously deliberate choices by the filmmaker that led me to consider why he went in the direction he did. And for me, taking this into consideration while watching helped me understand the movie better, as it is almost unsurprisingly at this point intended to subvert our expectations of what a comic book movie is. I'd say the real issue at hand here is the script itself and its execution, which really makes the film into again a messy and ultimately unfulfilling experience. When they all inevitably bust loose for the finale, the climax doesn't feel worth it devolving into a slog of fights, shocking deaths, obvious meta comic book references, and too many back-to-back -back twists that leave us scratching our heads wondering if this is what M. Night had in mind, then why did he even make Glass in the first place? It's just the kind of filmmaker M. Night is. He does his own thing and doesn't give a shit otherwise. But that isn't always necessarily to the audience's benefit, because no one would want Glass to wind up being the movie it did all except for M. Night. All of this might make it sound like I hate the movie, but honestly, I ended up liking it a lot more than I expected. It's just that the problems ended up way outweighing the positives, especially by the time Act 3 rolled around, which was misguided in almost every regard, especially cramming three twists in at the end. I know you're the twist guy and everything, but jeez. So anyway, let's dig into Glass, breaking down the story, the three big twists, and explaining the ending as well as the ultimate fate of our characters. In fact, the opening 10-15 to 15 minutes was nearly perfect, dropping us right back into David tracking down the beast, feeling like an interesting cat and mouse game that was set up that could have taken up the entire movie, and was exactly what I was hoping to see, even somehow marrying the very different tones and styles of Split and Unbreakable well together. Picking up a mere three weeks after the events of Split, we're in the in Superpower, David Dunn learned of the existence of Kevin Wendell Crumb and his many personalities referred to as the Horde, the most dangerous being the feral ceiling climbing the Beast. And in the 19 years since Unbreakable, David, now widowed, has been continuing his vigilante crime fightings in the streets of Philadelphia, now going by the moniker of the Overseer, as well as owning a security store with his now grown up son Joseph, who still idolizes his father as a real hero. Meanwhile, Kevin, still on the loose after Split, is up to his old tricks having captured a group of cheerleaders to act as his latest victims and potential food sources. But a chance encounter on one of David's walks makes physical contact with Kevin, here actually Hedwig, and through his powers, David sees a vision of the imprisoned girls, and with his son's help is able to track down their location to a warehouse in the area. He tears the girls free from the restraints, as an angry Kevin, now as the Beast, makes his presence known, leading to a knockdown dragout drag-out brawl between the two. Literally, they drag each other back and forth across the floor to take dominance, here appearing that their super strength is pretty much evenly matched, until the two crash through a window landing outside. But before they can continue their battle, they discover they are now surrounded by a swarm of police, who have a special kind of light that can subdue Kevin and force him to change to a different personality, neutralizing him into submission, as Dr. Ellie Stable emerges from the forces to talk to David, encouraging him to surrender instead of fighting, and the two are whisked away to a psychiatric facility, now under the care and supervision of Dr. Stable. And as it turns out, there's another old friend that's been tucked away there for many years. Elijah Price, aka Mr. Glass, the criminal mastermind and one-time adversary of David, who appears to have been heavily sedated all of this time to keep him from using his nefarious intellect. And the three are informed of Dr. Staple's intentions with them, that she specializes in the condition of people who believe they are superhuman, and has three days to convince the trio that they are in fact normal. To be on the safe side, she has equipped Kevin's room with the personality-changing light to 
tame the beast. And David's room is outfitted with sprinklers, her knowing that his supposed weakness is water. Staple first tries to utilize those closest to her patients. Elijah's mother still believing there is good in her boy. David's son, and finally Casey, the lone survivor of Kevin's recent slangs, who I found it odd would even be willing to meet with Kevin after what she went through, and you know, seeing all of her friends getting killed and eaten and everything. But anyway, she is able to reach Kevin by chanting his name, which saved her life previously. And for a moment, the horde is out of the light, and the real Kevin personality emerges, confused and weak, before quickly being squashed back into submission by the others. Attempting to deal with their delusion more directly, Staple then joins David, Elijah, and Kevin hear the Din mother, Patricia, in a group therapy session, probing them with the idea that their supposed superpowers can be explained away by real life evidence. David and Kevin do begin to question themselves if they truly are who they believe themselves to be, despite both of their previous films making it abundantly clear that they are both certainly superpowered human beings. And as such, it feels like this entire section is a complete waste of time. I mean, the beast was crawling around on the ceiling and shit. Don't think normal people, even if they have been watching climbing tutorials, could pull something like that off. As Mr. Glass, appearing drugged and completely out of it, is actually soaking up everything he's hearing, especially interested when hearing tale of this so-called the beast, wanting to see what he is truly capable of. But Mr. Glass wants more than just himself to see what the beast can do, and intends to unleash the beast upon the grand opening of a new building in town, the tallest skyscraper in the world, the Osaka Tower. The opening would no doubt be filled with thousands of bystanders and would be an ideal scenario for the beast to go absolutely crazy. Yet, as the film kept referencing the tower repeatedly popping up several times throughout, an alarming thought started entering into my head. Oh man, what if after all this constant buildup to the beast at the tower, we don't actually see this happen? Oh God, that would be so annoying. And guess what? That's exactly how it is. Clearly M. Night is pulling a fast one here as usual. There's the old story concept of Chekhov's gun. If you introduce a gun in act one, you have to shoot it in act three. That's paying it off. And that's precisely what this whole thing with the Osaka Tower is, but instead of delivering, he takes a big dump all over it instead. Way to go, subverting those expectations again. Thanks a lot, Shyamalan, you sick bastard. Nearly avoiding a lobotomy order by Staple, Mr. Glass reveals himself as not being drugged at all, but just pretending this whole time, stuffing his medication into a hollowed out part of his wheelchair, and lets Kevin in on his plan to unleash the beast at Osaka Tower, promising to take care of him. By doing so, it would bring all of Kevin's horde personalities to the light, or in dominance of Kevin's mind, putting the real person deep down inside seemingly permanently, and the two agree to team up. Up. Before leaving, they tend to the very few hospital employees around, and Elijah over the loudspeaker taunts David in his room, obviously relishing his role as the one behind pitting these two against each other, telling him that in order to stop the beast, he will have to use his superpowers to break free, shutting off the water protection system before escaping with Kevin through the tunnels, taking out a few more dudes on the way. But David isn't too far behind, summoning his super strength to bust free of his room, setting us up for our big final showdown, or at least something like that. That. Again, they don't make it anywhere near Osaka Tower. The entire finale only getting so far as the parking lot out front of the hospital. Something about the entire climax going down here was just really underwhelming. It's a parking lot! And for whatever reason, all of the other supporting characters are all around too. Mrs. Price, Joseph, and Casey joining the others outside. David confronts the beast, and the two as earlier in the film appear evenly matched, flinging each other around the area and crashing into cars, until Dr. Staple intervenes along with the fleet of police, sending more men after them, which doesn't do much good against this superpower duo, and it seems there will be no end to their battle. But Mr. Glass tries to sway things in Kevin's favor, revealing to him David's water weakness. But Joseph has his own ridiculous bombshell, torn from the pages of comic books, learned through his research into the origins of villains, revealing that the fateful crash of East Rail 177 that birthed David's journey into heroics, turns out Kevin's father was also on the same train. As we remember from Split, Kevin's father was killed in a train wreck, and it was as a result of this that his mother began to abuse him, which resulted in the creation of Kevin's multiple personalities, Mr. Glass effectively creating both of them with the East Rail crash that he orchestrated, this combining of both of their origins around this same crash being our first big twist. 
even though a lot of people theorized this already after Split. One person that didn't know this until now at least is Kevin, who after learning this realizes he can't trust Glass, and still in beast mode bear hugs Elijah, shattering his debilitatingly weak bones in his back, then tossing David into his water tank, which I'm not sure why they would put that right out front, right next to the building like that, but design choices aside, it is not good for David, who struggles in the tank, getting weaker, but manages to break it loose, spilling water all over the parking lot. Kevin retreats, telling him to meet him at Osaka Tower, and just as he's about to go there, seeing it tantalizingly in the skyline in the distance, a hand grabs Kevin, stopping him short. It's Casey, who using Kevin's full name as a kind of mantra, is again able to tame the beast, allowing the real Kevin to temporarily return to the surface. And it seems the crisis has been averted, until a shot rings out, hitting Kevin in the chest, blood spilling from his wound, and in his weakened state, the horde, along with Kevin soon, are no more. The troops then grab a still recovering David, dragging him to a water-filled pothole in the parking lot, dunking his head under over and over as David gasps for air. Before finishing the job though, Staple approaches and reaches out her hand, allowing David to touch it, and through his powers, seeing who she really is. Twist two, strap in folks. Touching her shows him a vision of Staple with a group of many others, all part of a secret underground society with the specific intention of keeping superhumans under wraps at any cost, here implying that they've been potentially around for thousands of years. Their mission is to keep the balance of humanity intact, believing these superhumans to be upsetting this balance. So they track them down and tend to them as seen with our trio. This meaning that the entirety of their so-called therapy was a ruse. But she does admit to David if she had convinced him that he was human, she would have left him alone. So perhaps to the cabal, as long as anyone that's super powered isn't actually using their powers, then they're okay. But it's too late to save poor David, as Staples group drowns him. Ay ay ay! there was already too much happening too quickly in the sequence. But something specifically about how David went out really bugged me. When this was unfolding on screen, I was like, what? That's how he dies? David Dunn? We've been waiting for 19 years for him to return. He's not in the movie nearly long enough and doesn't do anything for the whole hospital sequence. And the end result is that he gets drowned in a damn puddle in a parking lot. Chavalan, what is the matter with you, dude? You really don't give a shit, do you? <laughs> And I went back to that same thought that I was discussing earlier. He made this choice on purpose. You know, it's not like he thought, oh, this would be a totally dope way for Bruce to go out. The audience will love this. No, he went in the total opposite direction, giving him an absolutely pathetic, definitely unheroic death that would only ever make an audience call out in shock and disappointment. Obviously exactly what M. Night was intending here. Oof. And unbelievably, we aren't quite done yet, folks, as Mr. Glass on the verge of death is approached by Staple, telling him he was all wrong regarding his long-held belief in the connection between comic books and real heroes, smugly stating that it was in fact her organization that had been the true masterminds controlling superhumans, oppressing them to keep them a secret all of these years, just as Glass succumbs to his injuries. Believing she has succeeded once again, she deletes all of the hospital's surveillance footage, erasing any lingering evidence of the trio's presence there, but it instead looks as though Mr. Glass will have the last laugh this time. In our third twist, twist overload. As we flash back to earlier, seeing that Mr. Glass had previously hacked the hospital's camera system and uploaded all of the footage to his mother and others, all filled with proof of David and Kevin's superhuman abilities, their surviving loved ones banding together to spread the footage online, quickly spreading to the news and the public in mass, flooding them with the proof that there are superheroes out there in the world, the implications of which would fundamentally change things for humankind, and in the process also completely undoes Staple and her secret society's plan of suppressing them. At least in death, Mr. Glass had a big impact on the world and got one final mastermind move in there at the end. Though as Shyamalan has said he's done in the Eastrail universe, this ending only leaves us to speculate what this new world of heroes and villains would look like, which is kind of a bummer too. It leaves us more with 
implications than being exactly satisfying. I gotta say this whole parking lot finale really was too much happening too quickly. Maybe one twist too much, you know? The whole secret society angle seemed really odd, especially considering the whole concept is introduced and is destroyed two minutes later. It's like, whoa, secret society, huh? That's a big deal. Oh, they're done? Okay. Makes it have way less impact by doing it this way. I feel like this would have worked better as a late act two twist, with our trio learning about who Staple really is and banding together to take her down. But my point is the choices made could have worked better if executed in a different way. At least take some consideration of pleasing the audience. Sure, David can die if you really want him to, but at least give him a heroic sacrifice moment or something, you know? Instead of getting drowned helplessly in a pothole like a little bitch. I mean, come on. But I believe this actually all ties into the whole point Shyamalan is making here with his version of superheroes. That even if they have capabilities beyond man, they are still humans with respective weaknesses, which were easily exploited leading to their demises. Almost as if to say in his universe, superheroes really aren't more than humans with strange gifts, not the overpowered perfect gods of Marvel characters. And this overall statement about heroes does seem to fit in with the general themes that form the continuity of the three films that it is our weaknesses that truly define us as humans. Even if you can punch through steel doors and climb on the ceiling and stuff. With that, we have come to the conclusion of this ending explained on Glass. As you can no doubt tell from the video, I had a lot of complicated thoughts about Glass and the movie that M. Night chose to deliver. However, I still respect his specific intentions, even if it probably wasn't what anyone would have expected when they consider the possibilities of this crossover sequel. But leave it to M. Night to throw us yet a another curveball, and one that will no doubt divide people over the trilogy as a whole for quite some time. Oof. What did you guys think of Glass and its many twists? Was it a satisfying conclusion for the trilogy to you? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.